I think everybody's life is, is like a treasure hunt. When I was about five years old, I found an almost perfectly round stone. It looked like a tiny golf ball. I mean, it was washed by the sea, and it was beautiful. And I thought, this is proof. This is evidence. Evidence of what? I didn't know. But the fact that it was beautiful and that it was suddenly out there made not by me and not by anybody else, but made by somebody. And it was like an affirmation of some order in the world, which I didn't understand, but which I would find my way to try and look into <laughs> and research as time went on. My name is Jillian Peterson Craig, and I was born in New York City in 1938. My father was an engineer and an inventor mostly, and mother was a psychoanalyst, and uh, <laughs> I think I'm kind of a combination of both of them. I, I didn't like school. I couldn't bear to do things that weren't fun, but I also kind of managed to manipulate my way through it one way or another. When I was a child and dealing with school and thinking, when is this gonna be over? One of the things that crossed my mind is, well, whatever I'm gonna be, you know, a real estate agent, a biologist, or whatever it is, I'm not gonna be a teacher. That's off the table because <laughs> I never figured out how to be a good student. I wasn't interested in academics. I was only interested in art, and it was the only thing I could do, really. I grew up near the Metropolitan Museum, and I was taken there and really fascinated by the mummies in the Egyptian collection, because I was fascinated with death. The cook we had told me that her aunt died. I was about four or five. I said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, she died. She's not here anymore. I said, well, how can this be? I was astounded. I remember looking out the living room window at people passing by in New York. I thought, this is so strange. Now, either these people haven't heard about death I've seen them laughing and talking, or they've forgotten about it. There's something wrong here. Before I went to school, I used to open the door for mother's patients, because I could reach the doorknob. And I would follow them into the waiting room, and I would sit across from them like this, and ask them about death, working them over before they went in to see mother. <laughs> but I was amazed, and then I realized, well, they've forgotten about death. And little by little, I kind of forgot about it, but I never did. And so my search for something permanent was what happened in the Metropolitan Museum. I knew there was certainly something transient about life, but there, there must be or there should be something permanent. So the Egyptian statues there, the beautiful, enormous statues of heroes and gods were the closest thing to eternity. And I was fascinated. It made a difference for me because I felt very connected to them. I went to art school. I went to the Rhode Island School of Design, really because <laughs> I couldn't get in any place else. I didn't have any kind of marks. A lot of other very, very gifted people at RISD, and I'm not particularly gifted. I have, I have something, but really it's nothing special. What I have, though, is a kind of persistence about things to stay with it. 
formerly, I didn't quite know why I was painting. I enjoyed it, but somehow that's not enough. That's okay for children. But what happens when you're a grown-up, like me? Well, you can't just do things because they're fun. It's for some meaning. And I didn't know what the meaning of it all was <laughs> and why I was doing it. One thing I realized, though, I got a lot of attention from making paintings. People said, oh, that that's looks good, that's nice, you can do something. And I felt, gee, I makes me feel like somebody. It gives me a sense of self-definition and a sense of self-esteem. So I thought, maybe that's the reason. But you see, it isn't the reason, because then if you're working in order to gain somebody else's approval to be okay about life, then you're very vulnerable. I went to graduate school at Cornell, and that was also very helpful. But the real education that I had started after school, I got four part-time jobs in Boston, washing the dishes, cleaning up different things, very menial work and running all over Boston to fulfill these jobs. I was completely on my own, painting in my bedroom. At one point, I remember thinking, can I really do this? And then I realized I have to do it. It's the only thing where the door is open for me. I had Wednesday and Sunday afternoons when I wasn't working. Otherwise, I was working seven days a week. And those periods of time I painted wasn't very good and it wasn't very much. But during that time, instead of my using painting to, to feel good about myself, to feel, to compete with others and say, I'm a little better than this person or that, or to feel, yeah, I got some feedback, people like me, something changed. I came to painting as a consolation for the rest of my life. I came to feel a real affection and gratitude for the experience. And this is a bigger frame of reference than just using it to furnish me with some self-esteem or something. So having experienced that, I felt that I might be able to teach, but only after that. Because unless you really able to come from some kind of inner relationship with painting, you're very vulnerable to fortune, if you will. Before this experience, all I knew was that I was trying to develop some technique that was going to be sufficient for doing what I wanted to do, and also that I really loved painting. I wasn't sure I loved it. But after this very difficult encounter with the world and realizing that painting was always there for me. It was always a source of love and a source of energy and a source of inspiration. And the more I felt it gave me that kind of gift, the more gratitude I had for it. And that has never changed or left. So this gratitude, which is the bedrock of the rest of my relationship with painting was enough to convince me, yes, I have something I can share with confidence with other people. I got a job teaching at Cornell and that was a wonderful boon. And I learned a great deal trying to understand how how do I know what I know and how can I help other people? And it helped me to, to learn how to paint myself. It's not like the journey was over. I can, I know, now I know all about it. Because the next big thing is I didn't feel like I had anything of my own. I loved such great, huge painters like Vermeer. I loved his work, you know, and I thought, what should I contribute to art? that Vermeer has not already contributed, and Terborg, and Enzor, and Caravaggio, and these list of giants that I love. What can I offer? It's a very big question.
One way to escape answering that is to keep yourself as a student and keep making exercises for yourself. But at one point, I had a wonderful experience, and this I wrote about in the book. My friend James Mahoney gave me a Tanagra figurine from Greece. As a still life painter, I have a whole collection of objects that are paintable. And when he brought this object into the studio, I looked at her and I said, yes, this is a special object. And so I set it up in still lifes and tried to paint it in different ways. And it was indeed a special object. And I came to realize that there are objects in the outside world that represent my own inner world. When I saw it, I recognized her as a kind of deputy of a hidden world within myself. I couldn't access this directly. You see, I could access it only by recognizing it out there. So my still life objects, they're all useful. I use them constantly. Some of them are special objects. And by that, I mean they have this special status. And one of the attributes of that is that they're inexhaustible. Each time I painted it, it was a new experience. Why? Because it was actually a symbol of something that was huge and unseen. My effort to paint this unseen world took a concrete form in this object. I began looking for this same phenomena in other people's work, and I see it all the time. I saw in some students, sometimes it takes the form of a color. They go through a six-month period, everything has to be chartreuse. It's just magic, because this is something in them. It's not really out there. Paper wouldn't have seemed to me paintable a couple of years earlier. Suddenly it was such a wonderful object and it's the only thing I wanted to paint. It was infinite. Why is paper an infinite object? Well, part of it's so ephemeral. And yet, uh, when you paint it, it's there for, for a long time. You see, it's got this mysterious double life. It looks like an ordinary thing, but it also has the potential to be eternal or infinite. So this experience helped me enormously to answer one of the big questions that I have. What shall I paint? We all have a whole world of content within us that wants to seek expression, it finds expression in one way or another, depending on our temperament. And again, it was another way to reassure myself that I wasn't dependent on <laughs> the uh, ephemeral nature of the outside world or of other people's approval or of what they suggested to me. That This is a way to make a dialogue with yourself that leaves you without the need of defense and competition. After that, it was no problem to teach because I had something that I felt was very important and valuable and something which I feel is very difficult to access because the whole world and the educational system is so terribly competitive. You're always thinking, I should do better than this person and that person and asking other people to give them a sense of self-esteem. The reason that I put the book together was to collect a handful of ideas that really helped me learn how to paint and how to live in the art world and how to live with myself. One of the biggest ideas, and this is not my idea, this is an idea that was in Carl Jung, he made a statement in one of his essays that is so spare. He said there are two kinds of visual experiences. You can either have the experience of a symbol or a sign. And what he meant by that is a sign, something that leads us back into the world. 
a portrait is a sign if it's really just the representation of the person. A symbol, on the other hand, is something that refers to a hidden world or a world that we don't see. It refers to something transcendent. It's a suggestion of something that's more than it is. <laughs> it's the only way I can put it. When I was growing up, there was pop art installation, all, all these different things. It was very hard to tell what was entertainment and what was art. Entertainment is something different than art, although if it ends in an experience of being moved, then one could say it is really a symbol rather than a sign. So it's very important to me, if you're looking at art, is that you ask, what's the purpose of this? Because you can't evaluate it unless you know what's the goal. If you're looking at Vermeer and you really want to be shocked, well, you're not going to get very far. If you're looking at some of Andy Warhol's stuff, or Jeff Koons is an example, because he's really into shock and entertainment. It isn't to be moved, no. And so, to me, really important to make that distinction, because otherwise you can just be traveling around and, and get really lost. And I see many people are in that situation. There are many moments in my education as a painter I would regard as important steps along the way. And at RISD, there was a big one. A lot of my motivation had been to be a good student. I wasn't really sure that I was a painter. I mean, I was there at RISD. I was painting. I looked like a painter. I used to dress like a painter. But I didn't know I really was a painter or not. As a senior, we each had a separate studio. And I was panicked because I walked in there, there was nothing. Nobody was telling me what to do. Blank canvas. Formerly, I'd been painting rather big abstract paintings because that's what everybody was doing. Because the big news there was Kostin and de Kooning and the whole faculty were painting abstractly. So that's what we did. And it was fun and adventurous and so forth. I never really felt a great deal of relationship to it, but it's what we were doing, and I always wanted to try and do the best I could. The other thing about that time in history, any academic stuff that you did was being put down as illustration. Now, illustration was way down there. Painting was way up there. In senior year, you suddenly have to be the author of the experience as well as the person who executes it. You've got to be the student and the teacher. I panicked and I decided as a teacher I would give myself some exercises. So I made some little color studies or something and I remember putting them up on the wall. And my teacher, Bob Hamilton, came in and he looked up there and he saw in a minute what I was doing. He said, you don't have to do these exercises anymore. You can make works of art. I said, oh my God, you know, I felt like a, a wave of nausea came over me. I said, well, well, how do I do that? Oh, he said, it's so easy. He said, just paint what you can and paint what you love. I thought, paint what I can, paint what I love. Isn't it more complicated than that? No, it's not. That was one of the things that really was a turning point. I took that on board when I wasn't solving the whole problem. A little bit earlier than that, there was another experience at RISD that same year when I had been painting abstractly, these big abstract canvases, and trying my best to get involved with them, feeling somewhat detached from them, really. And I remember this Sunday morning, I walked up there, and there was nobody else in the studio, so it was really empty. Nobody else to compete with or to socialize with, just me in the studio. And I remember putting on the radio, smoking, and the kind of peaceful atmosphere where I felt kind of at ease with life. 
I thought, well, when I get to painting and looked around at these half-finished abstract paintings, and I saw one that had a broken stretcher. And I thought, well, I'm gonna throw that out. But I thought, you know, it had a piece of purple and a piece of brown and green. I thought, I'll just have fun with that. And I remember sketching in a little figure in the foreground, a figure of a man sitting, and I made a landscape out of it. And I thought, yeah, I like this. I like the way this looks. And it was the first real representational painting that I had done. And it suddenly really felt like me. And it was a very profound experience where I had stumbled on what my real interest is, which is not to let go of the representational image. From then on, it was a question to find out what kind of content I wanted to deal with and how to learn how to paint and draw. I know that other people proceed differently and they ricochet around into a lot of different things and it helps them to give up things they feel that they love and try things that they've never done uh, just to shake things up. I've never had that kind of temperament so I've always proceeded from things that I love to things that I love more. It's a different way of, of proceeding. I think to really understand what you love is a huge lifetime journey. What shall I paint and how shall I paint it? What shall I paint comes from some effort at recognition in who we are as we are growing and unfolding our life. How shall I paint is another enormous question. Art comes out of nature, it comes out of our inner life, and it comes out of other art. How shall I paint largely comes out of other art. There are many great primitive painters, like Horace Pippin and Henri Rousseau. They're great painters, but they're not really interested in the tradition of art. But I feel that in order to develop the kind of technique that interests me, it has to come out of looking at other art. So a part of my work as a painter is looking at art. I look at Vermeer and I just feel like he's king of the hill, technically. Curiously, he ends up not to be someone who I emulate technically. Roman art epitomizes my goals. I think they are really extraordinary artists. And then that whole early pre-Renaissance tradition that is really related to that. Giotto, Bernardo Dadi, Francesco di Giorgio, and Lorenzetti, these early Italian painters who push color around that is very, very risky and really very, very impressive. So that's part of our journey, not only making the, the trip inward to ask, what do I want? What do I love? But also to look out into the world and see who else is painting and to, to feel yourself as part of the world this way, too. I usually start from some representational situation. And the first stage of the painting is just looking at whatever, say, a still life and putting down the facts, trying to put down the right proportion and 
try to put down what I see. And before I cover the canvas, the image has a certain amount of energy because when you leave white canvas, <laughs> it just donates energy to the whole experience for some reason. As soon as the whole thing is covered, it kind of drops dead because, okay, I got all the facts now and uh, so what? <laughs> you know, I might as well have uh, taken a photo. So then the next thing is to look at the painting and say, why did I do this in the first place? There was something about the setup that I found mysterious or interesting or beautiful or something. And I see how much of that has been transferred to the canvas. If not, then I start over. But if there is a glimmer of that original energy, then I start pushing things around on the canvas. This time, it's not that I'm not looking at the still anymore, but I transfer some of my energy to just looking at the canvas. And if, after working on it, to try to make something meaningful to me, it has slipped away. If my paintings aren't working, if they haven't been, quote, visited, and if they don't have any insight into them, then it doesn't matter how much time or energy I've put into it. You know, I could have been working on it for five years. If it's not working, it's not working. So one of the things that I do, it's something I invented by mistake. I cover the whole canvas, or maybe part of it, usually the whole thing, with some kind of color. I, I wipe it out. It looks like I actually cancel out the whole painting. In fact, I lose it. And more literally, I let go of it. I let go of it, and then I wipe it down so there's some trace of what exists underneath it. And then I can kind of evoke it back into being, but in a whole new way. It risks losing the painting, but it's the only, it's the only thing to do. It's either artificial respiration or a mercy killing. And uh, <laughs> so this is a process where that goes on, and then either I can make it live again in a new way or not. People have asked me why I paint in this small scale. I haven't always painted that way, but most of my life I have. I think all of us have a scale that's appropriate for whatever self-expression we are engaged in. And the scale in which you paint has to do with the size of your brushstroke, really. Discovering what kind of mark you make, to a large extent, determines what kind of scale are you going to work in. But also, there's a kind of scale that we're all at home with. Bonard's work is very interesting because he has tiny paintings, big paintings, not huge, but some of them very sizable. So he's a painter who has a whole range of scales. Vermeer was a kind of middle size person. So the scale that you love and that works for you is a big part of discovering what kind of painting you want to make. Of all of the elements that go into picture making, design, drawing, color, color is the most powerful and important part of it. Color is such a powerful experience that many people are actually, it's one of two things, they feel it's frightening or they feel it's trivial, that it's something extra, the important thing is drawing, you see. In fact, it's neither of these things. It's a very important central part of painting. It's very difficult to teach and very difficult to learn because it's really a function of feeling. It's nothing you can demand of yourself. And I don't feel that you can understand color. You can love it and get into it through affection and love and curiosity and fascination but you can't beat up on yourself and, 
you know, get into it through guilt or discipline. Or, it doesn't reveal itself that way. And likewise, the observer is touched by color if they are able to receive those feelings from you, you see. That's why people love paintings that have a lot of color. I mean, they're excited by them, they feel alive when they see them. But it's a very complex issue because great color is not a lot of color, it's just the right color. And that means you have to think about the content, the context in which it's used. People have said to me, oh, you're so disciplined. I said, no, that's the last thing I am. It isn't discipline that keeps me in the studio. There are disciplined painters I really respect, but I'm not one of them. What I am is addicted, and that's a very different experience. These two things aren't mutually exclusive, but an addiction is where you have an experience that really satisfies you and inspires you and gives you something that you get no other way, and then so you're brought back to it. And after you have, either as an observer of art or as a person who is making it, you have this experience of being moved, uh, you're addicted because there is something about it that <laughs> cancels out time and space and uh, lifts you out of yourself. Why should you want to be lifted out of yourself? Why? Because there is something painful about the existing separation that we are born into. We're separate from each other, we're separate from the world and we die, and we pass away, and we leave each other, and so forth. So the experience of being moved is medicine for that. I think of it as healing, but it's a kind of way of erasing that experience. How does painting compensate or help you with the experience of the pain of separation? If you're painting, you know, you're painting along, you know, slogging, and making this work, that work, your hand is going back and forth from the palette to the painting, then you stop, you look at it, you say, did I do that? The answer is no. <laughs> you didn't. The didn't do it is the part that's fearful and separated. It was gone. It was gone for a period of time. And while it was gone, the other part of you, <laughs> the part of you that really is connected with everything, was in play there. And the chances are you would uh, see something on the canvas worth looking at. So if you have that experience once or twice, everything else seems like very small potatoes. And this is the only thing, this is the only thing that seems interesting. I call it the experience of being moved. So you have the experience of being absent. That's one way to tell. Another way is where you are working and you're working and you think, whoa, three hours? I just sat down here. So that time has no meaning. <laughs> time is like that veil that separates us from a unified experience. It's part of our life. It's practical and everything. but. It disappears. I mean, time flies when you're having fun, you see. In a curious way, I really feel that it's fun and love and affection and curiosity that render the, the most profound experiences we have in life. This is the big point, is what is the experience of being moved? And what is it about it that makes people addicted. What's the difference between the kind of experience that a person who goes to a museum and sees something really inspiring and beautiful takes their breath away, they feel released, they feel expanded, they feel 
uh, they feel hopeful. And for me, you see, that's, that's why I think of, of painting as a healing experience, because inspiration isn't an extra thing. Feeling inspired and feeling like there's something to reach for and something hopeful is, is not an extra experience. It's like more important than food, really. <laughs> I asked my friend, Colleen, who's a painter, I asked her about her experience of being moved. I thought she was going to tell me of a painting that she had seen. No, she said, you know, I'm really moved when I see somebody doing something for another person without hope of any recompense. You see, that's again, going beyond your yourself, going beyond your little, what can I gain from every little experience? No, it's coming out of, out of a loving expansion where you identify with the other person. And it's only in these little gestures, which we make every day in little ways that give meaning to our life. It isn't accumulating wealth and all of that stuff. Come on, it's really not about that. So that's what painting gives us an opportunity to research and think about. It makes us invincible and therefore when we have a source of love like this, it gives us the possibility of loving other things and other people. You can only give out what you have, you see. In the Eastern tradition about spiritual life, the divine takes the form of truth, beauty, and love. These three things. Beauty isn't often talked about. But there is for those of us who are moved by things that are beautiful, this is definitely another path to self-realization. When I'm painting, it comes to me often, how am I doing? I'm painting along, I'm having fun, I'm pushing the paint around. And then, I don't know, it gets difficult, and then I feel insecure, I feel hopeless. I lean back and I think, is this as good as Cezanne? <laughs> as soon as I ask that, I might as well leave the studio and turn on the TV, because then something else is operating there, which is my anxiety or fear or whatever. I would say that most painters fend off this question continually throughout the day. As soon as things go south in the studio and they're not working so well, you begin to doubt yourself and you say, am I any good? Well, then, then you have a problem. In fact, under the radar, there are a huge number of very, very gifted people out there. I don't know if I'm really one of them, but I've stopped asking that question because it doesn't seem relevant. For most of us, when work is going well, when we are engaged in painting, whether it's succeeding or not, but engaged, there are no problems. <laughs> Situation in America, piece of cake. Third World War, no problem. <laughs> Terminal cancer, who cares? because you're at peace with life in that situation. So I look at it that way, you know. The question, how am I doing, is not a useful question, but it's one that sits so close to us and, and bugs us continually. I see color not uh, like they are uh, normally, you know. We see colors in the object, you know. Yeah. We see all are. I heard an interview with Federico Fellini, and he was asked about his experience, what he feels the whole point of his life was. He said, I am a servant to my imagination. So I never thought of it that way how you can be in service to something in yourself which is like a spark of something that's more interesting, more objective, more... 
more expansive than just your little personality. And it's not seen that way, not necessarily seen as service. You think of the word service and you think of a person bringing meals on wheels to another person. But there is another kind of service, which is to serve that part of yourself, which is a higher part. And in doing that, whatever you come up with will serve other people. And that's the basis on which you have the experience of being moved, put it that way.